Okay, so is, is um, are the students there? Can oh, yeah. you tell them? Yeah. Okay, great. So let me close that. Okay, so let's begin with some uh, quick announcements first. Uh, so first of all, the, I hope everyone enjoyed their fall break and uh, I didn't get any um, angry emails from the students about the midterms. I assume everyone did okay. Um, but Naren will go over the solutions uh, today at the end of today's lecture. Um, so yeah, feel free to, I mean, the, the most important thing, like I said, in the beginning of the class is make, I want to make sure that all of you are able to um, pursue this problem. So if you see a problem, you should know what techniques to use to, to solve it. Okay, another important announcement is to meet with the technical mentors this week. So this is uh, today is October 18th. So, um, and this is important because uh, this, uh, the, the mentors will be grading you. So and the, the grading will be based upon your meeting with the mentors. And the goal of the meeting, as I said in my, uh, in, uh, like I said last time, is for you to make your presentation for assignment two to the mentors, even if it is in a draft form, and elicit feedback from the mentors. That's the key idea. And the assignment two is due next week, October 27th. Okay. Um, are there any questions about that? Before I go on. Uh, no. Okay, great. So let's then talk about uh, the schedule very quickly. So today we're going to talk about radiometry, photometry, and as I and all the notes are here. There are some uh, additional resources here which I encourage you to read. On Thursday we'll have a, a lecture from uh, Natan Chetrik from the Technology Venture Commercialization Office uh, about uh, commercialization resources, primarily those available at the U, but also different um, activities that are required. And this is, of course, very important for your final assignment, so make sure you attend on Thursday. Next Tuesday, we have a very special class, uh, which is a, we'll, we're going to do an activity in the class, which is basically to do what's called a business model canvas. Uh, and we'll, I'll be there in person, so we'll do this together as, a, as each team. Um, but before you actually come to class, I need you to watch the uh, lectures zero and one on Audacity. And uh, there's a link there and you can sign up, it's free. You can watch the first two lectures. And if you need, if you want to learn more about this uh, Canvas uh, concept, uh, I have linked here. And I highly encourage you to watch the lectures, take a quick look at it before coming to class next Tuesday. And next Thursday is when your team innovation presentations are on, and we'll talk uh, more about it. Uh, actually, let me just mention that here. The assignment to instructions have been provided to you, and it's right here. You can see it. Well, then out of the way. Okay, it's a 15 minute presentation, just like before, next Thursday, uh, October 27th. Uh, key things are ident identify three main problems with existing technologies, uh, and it can be more than three, I would say at least three important problems. Uh, list the results of your brainstorming session, and you can present maybe three crazy or approximately three or more if you want novel ideas. Uh, be creative here, but be aware of physics. Um, pick one idea, uh, or more than one, and describe it in a bit more detail. Explain why this is novel, uh, why someone hasn't done it before, uh, or if someone hasn't done it, has done it before, what are you doing differently, and how it will solve the problem you listed in uh, one. And finally, if you have any pre uh, preliminary calculations, simulations, and analysis of your selected innovation, um, be as quantitative as you can, but uh, since your next assignment will be a more detailed simulation technical analysis or built up, uh, you can leave that to that uh, next assignment. And uh, on the 27th, we will have uh, visitors from the TVC who will serve as your commercialization mentors uh, starting uh, the following week um, after the week before Thanksgiving, um, which is actually here. Uh, they will attend uh, assignment to presentations as well. So, uh, right here. So anyway, you can look at the schedule. So let's uh, jump right in. Are there, first of all, are there any questions before I do this? Uh, I don't think so, you can go ahead. Okay, great. 
So, so let's jump right into today's lecture. Um, so, so far we have been talking about measuring uh, light in terms of uh, what are called radiometric units, which means power in watts, intensity in watts per meter squared, uh, flux in uh, watts per meter squared and so on. So these are radiometric units. What that quantities. What that means is that these are quantities, if you place a power meter in the, in the sunlight or in, the, in, the, in a beam, you will get a measurement. Now, photometry is something somewhat different. Photometry relates to human vision. So our human eye has certain uh, preferred colors that we see more sensitively than others. And then we need to define certain quantities to define photometric units. Now, these photometric units are different than radiometric units. And we need to understand this because in non-imaging optics where we want to, for instance, design a daylighting system or a lighting system for automobiles or, or for cars or traffic lights or whatever, you need to understand how the human eye uh, relates to the, the light, which is why the photometry is important. And we'll also talk about color. So let's jump right in. So the key things are the units and the quantities are different and the terminology is different and the terminology is uh, not familiar to us. So it's important to know what these things mean. So we'll, we'll spend a, a, about a half of the lecture basically defining uh, quantities. First, we'll start with something we're very familiar with, radiation flux. We talked about it in solar uh, illumination. This is basically the quantity of energy that is emitted, transmitted or received per unit time. Of course, uh, if you're talking about the sun, it is emitted. Um, if it is you know, a window, for example, it is transmitted. And if it's a solar cell, it is received, and it's per unit term. So phi, the capital phi, is dq over dt, where dq is the energy and dt is time. So it's variation. So if you have a lamp here, it's a total amount of power, uh, or joules energy, divided by time. Of course, because uh, this is radi radiant flux or radiation flux or radiant power is in watts. It's joules per second. So that's very simple. Now, when you talk about the human eye, human eye has a different uh, uh, sensitivity to different colors. And this is defined by something called luminous flux. This can be defined as the perceived power of light by the human eye, and this is measured in a unit called lumens. Okay, so here we have radiant flux measured in watts, and here we have luminous flux measured in lumens. And the key is that the human eye has different sensitivities at different wavelengths, and this is described approximately by what's called the luminous efficacy function, and that's plotted here. So this is the relative sensitivity of the human eye as a function of wavelength. So you can see our eyes have been evolved to essentially be very sensitive at 516, about 555 nanometers or so. And, and there is a clear, clear reason for this. The clear reason is that this is the peak of the radiation from the sun, okay? as we recall from one of our previous lectures. And that's why our eyes also were sensitive to it. And it falls off, and, and the colors are shown here. So we are most sensitive here. So if we want to design a, day, a, a lighting system for a room, for example, we want to take this into account, which is why we want to define these photometric quantities, which are different than radiometric quantities. We want to weight the power of the different wavelengths based upon this high response. That's the key idea. So now let's define the quantities. The first... Uh, uh, thing to keep in mind is basically the sensitivity of the eye to different wavelengths, which we just saw. And this is defined as what's called the luminosity function. Okay, it's also called the photopic luminous efficiency function. It is nothing, the simplest way to think about this intuitively is that this is simply the sensitivity of the light as a function of, of, of the human eye as a function of wavelength. Okay, and the, in the normalized version, it is written as B of lambda, Okay, and this is dimensionless, and you can see if you go back here, this is normalized to one, so it's dimensionless. Okay, you take that function and multiply it by 683, it gives you what's called luminous efficacy. And this is simply to define it in lumens per watt. Lumens, if you remember, is the unit here of luminous flux. 
okay, which is the human eye response, and watts is the power, the radiometric value, and the ratio is basically the efficiency or the efficacy or the sensitivity of light. Now, of course, you don't need to memorize any of this, but the, the key idea is that in principle, these functions depend upon the light level. In other words, if you're under bright uh, daylight conditions or very dim, dark, dusk conditions, they're very different. And that's plotted here. And this is important for a practical point of view. So the photopic response, this is, by the way, the uh, luminous efficacy, again, lumens per watt, the same thing we just talked about here, and this is wavelength. This plot here, so-called photopic response, refers to the response of the eye under well-lit conditions, bright conditions. Okay, so this is what usually what your eye will do during daytime. However, under low light conditions, under when you're in the dark room or in the evening or night, your response shifts. It becomes something called like this. It's called scotopic, or it can also be called mesopic. And they're slightly different depending upon the, it's a, it, of course, these are psychological also because the brain responds to these things differently. So these are averaged over many people, obviously. Uh, one important thing you will notice with the shift between this curve and let's say the photopic curve and the scotopic curve is that the peak has now gone from uh, yellow green to something more like blue green. It became more bluish, which means under low light conditions, our vision is more sensitive to blue light. Okay, and there are some important physiological reasons for it, which we don't have time to go into, but it's, that's the situation. Now, why is this important? Let's take a look. Let's take a look at these two situations here. So you, on, on the left-hand side, we have high-pressure sodium lamps lighting a parking lot. On the right-hand side, we have metal halide lamps, which are essentially riding, uh, lighting a, a, a promenade, let's say a road. So if you think about this, which street lighting is better for driving? I want you to spend 30 seconds just thinking about what I just told you in the last slide and, and, and this situation here. Then you can discuss with your, with your, with your neighbors as well. So the, the key idea, of course, is the color, right? The high-pressure sodium lamps are more yellow, whereas the metal halide lamps are more bluish white. And not, not because of the sky, but you can just look at the color, the, the light is. So this is more reddish, right? This is more, you know, cool white, let's call it. So which one would be better? Any, any guess? Sodium seems to be the... Yeah, okay, so let's think about what that means. Uh, it could be, depends on the situation, but if, coming, if you just think about the situation of what I just told you, that under low light conditions, the peak response of now has shifted blue, I would say the metal halide lamp is better because you have more blue component of light here and your light is more sensitive to it because street lights are used under dust conditions or low light conditions. Okay, but if you absolutely blast it, like under, make it completely well illuminated, like as shown here, then this situation is okay. The sodium lamps are okay. By the way, uh, let me just pause and show you one very interesting point related to this. I put a link to it, but there was a, a very interesting article about how LED street lights are causing um, psychological issues in certain neighborhoods. And I, uh, I would highly recommend reading it it's uh, in the IEEE spectrum and you can go through it. Uh, but this basically talks about how the colors or the, 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 the peak wavelengths in the LED light affect the, the psychology of people living in these neighborhoods. So these things are um, very relevant. But anyway, so you have an idea why color is important and why we need to think about these photometric units. Now let's start defining, are there any questions? Uh, none. Okay, so let's start defining uh, some of the some of the more um, 
more detailed, more more complex quantities. So first of all, all the you know other than a laser, all sources emit more than one wavelength. So they are not going to talk about lasers here. So this you know so the source emits more than one wavelength, and the strength of the total visual sensation can be calculated as follows. And this is called the total luminous flux measured in lumens is simply 683, which is that constant we saw before, integral of phi of lambda, which is a source spectrum. So spectral response, spectral uh, illumination from the source, irradiance of the source, again, watts per nanometer uh, per meter squared, uh, times the sensitivity response of the eye Okay, so 683 times that is what we saw before. Of course, if you multiply the sensitivity response with the spectrum of the source and you integrate over all the wavelengths, you get the total luminous flux. So this makes sense. It's intuitive, it's common sense. The source spectrum, of course, is in units of watts per unit wavelength, and this is in units of lumens per watt. Okay, so the watts cancels out, and what you end up, because unit wavelength is integrated out, what you end up with lumens. So you can check the dimensions also. So now let's define what is a lumen. The lumen is a unit of luminous flux, okay, as we just talked about, which is a measure of the total amount of visible light emitted by a source. Okay, and the visible light is important because that's what our human eye is sensitive to. This differs from power, which would be the analogous radiometric quantity, since luminous flux takes into account the wavelength sensitivity of the human eye. Now, in order to define the lumen, we have to start with a unit called a candela. Okay, this is a unit that was used uh, previously. It's somewhat still also used to define brightness as perceived by the human eye. Technically, it is the unit of luminous intensity, which is power emitted by a source in a specific direction with the spectral sensitivity of the human eye taken into account. So it is power in a given direction. Now, what does that mean? Direction is defined in terms of solid angle. Okay, so solid angle is angle we all know in two dimensions. Solid angle is angle in three dimensions, defined as to radians. Okay, and power per unit solid angle is luminous intensity, and that is if uh, units are in candelas. And we'll see what this means uh, shortly. So the definition is relatively straightforward. The candela is the luminous intensity in a given direction of a source that emits monochromatic radiation of a certain frequency that's just uh, yellow green light. So it doesn't matter. This is the frequency. You can figure out what the wavelength is. But it has a radiant intensity in that direction of one, one over 683 watts per star radian. So a candela is one over 683 watts per star radian of that particular wavelength of light. So the unit, if you want to compare it to an analogous radiometric unit, is watts per star radian. Star radian is a solid angle. Approximately one candela is also the luminous intensity of one candle. So this is what was used in the last century, for example. So one lumen, which is luminous flux, is one candela multiplied by one star radian. Okay, candela is like an intensity. It is per unit solid angle, whereas lumen is integrated over all the solid angles. So we'll do some examples to, to make this clear. So uh, let's start with a very simple example. So if you have a light source that uniformly irradiates one candela in all directions, it has a total luminous flux of one candela, one CD, multiplied by the total star radiance in all directions, which is four pi. So if you have a sphere, it's emitting in all directions, the total solid angle is four pi star radiance. So one candela multiplied by four pi, which is about 12.57 lumens. So if you have a light source of one candela and it's emitting into an entire sphere, the total flux coming out of it is 12.57 lumens. Okay, now let's think about some simple examples here. So I want you guys to, uh, I want you all to talk to your neighbors and try to solve this problem. What is the maximum luminous flux of an LED whose luminous intensity is one millicandela? Okay, uh, why don't you think about it for about 30 seconds and then we'll try to solve it together.
and you're free to discuss, obviously. So to address this question, first of all, we need to understand what is what is the uh, what is the millikandela. Millik the the millikandela is like intensity. Keep that in mind. It is the amount of uh, visual light power, let's call it, that is going per uh, this being output per unit solid angle. Okay. Now then, the next question is. How much solid angle is an LED emitting into? Of course, it depends on the LED, so you have to make some assumption. But let's make the assumption that it's not emitting into a full sphere because usually the LED has one half of it is blocking the light, right? It's only emitting into one hemisphere, so half a sphere. So the total solid angle is not four pi, but it's half of that, which is two pi star radians. Okay, so the maximum luminous flux would be one millicandela multiplied by two pi star radians. So it'll be two pi times 10 raised to minus three lumens. Okay, so uh, I know some of this is a little bit abstract because you haven't seen this before. So I would highly recommend going back and, and just doing this yourself, just to prove to yourself that you can follow the, follow the logic. Let's do a few more examples. So uh, another more important unit that is used today is called a lux. Lux is the SI unit of luminance or luminous emittance. Okay, so if you go buy a bulb today, they will tell you what the, how many lux is it. Or if you look at a display, an LCD display of your iPad, it will have a lux for your backlight. And this essentially measures what's called the luminous flux per unit area. Luminous flux per unit area. So this is equivalent to intensity in radiometric optics. So one lux is equal to one lumens per meter squared and lumens is the flux, remember, and that's the area. Lumens is simply candela times the radian. So it's candela, solid angle. Candela is the uh, luminous, um, uh, oops. Candela is the luminous intensity. Okay. That is lumens per steradian. So candela times the radians gives me lumens, divided by meter squared gives me lux. Okay, so let's do a couple of simple examples. Uh, and again, I want you to think about this yourself, uh, discuss it with your neighbor. If we want to achieve an illuminance of 500 lux for a home kitchen, what is the minimum required luminous flux from a single fluorescent light? Okay, I'll let you think about it for 30 seconds, and then we'll address. And and feel free to discuss with your with your neighbors. It, it's important to do these experiment these practice uh, problems because that's the only way to gain some intuition into into what these units and quantities mean. That's why I'm asking you to do. Okay, so let's see what this means. So first of all, the idea is we need an illuminance of 500 lux. Okay, so the lux is 500. And the question is, what is the minimum required luminous flux from a single person? Uh, the luminous flux is lumens, right? So it's very simple. So we just need to know what the area of the kitchen is. So let's say it's 10 meters squared. So let's say it's 10, the denominator, how many lumens? You just take the illuminance multiplied by the area. So it's 500 lux times 10 meters squared. Let's say it's 5,000 lumens. If you have a single fluorescent light. Okay, so very, very simple, simple concept. 
Of course, then the question is, what if we wanted to light an entire soccer field? So much, much larger, maybe 10,000 meters square. Then the number of the, and if you want the same illuminance, which is 500 lux to illuminate the entire soccer field, of course you need as multiply by the area. So you will get, you know, that's just 10,000, 500 times 10,000, okay? So obviously when you, uh, the key concept I want you to gain here is that the lux represents a form of unit area measurement of brightness, whereas lumens is the total amount of brightness. Okay, that's the intuitive concept I want you to get. So in other words, the, lum, the, the lux is the same in the case of the home kitchen or the soccer field, but, but even though they have orders of magnitude in area difference, uh, the difference manifests itself not in the lux or the luminance, but it comes in the luminance flux. Okay, where you have to multiply that area. So you have to think about this a little bit. Okay, so moving on, we, have, we can define equivalent uh, radiometric quantities um, as follows. First, we have emittance, which is radiation flux emitted per unit surface area. So M is D phi or DA. DA is the infinitesimal area emitting radiation. So we can do, uh, define emittance for the sun, for example. We can have irradiance, which is a radiation flux falling on a surface. It's watts per meter squared. Of course, the units here are also watts per meter squared. This is also the same, D phi or DA, except now that you have the area which is receiving radiation. So this would be like a solar cell. That would be the sun. The units are all the same. The corresponding photometric quantities, so these are radiometric quantities measured in watts per meter squared. Corresponding photometric quantities, illuminance, which is in units of lux, which is what we just talked about. Okay, the intensity is defined as flux per unit solid angle, as we saw before. So intensity is watts divided by unit solid angle, watts per steradian. Okay, so that is intensity or radiant intensity. Uh, we can also define this in units of candela, as, as we saw before, okay. The corresponding photometric quantity is luminous intensity with the units of candelas or lumens per steradian, as we saw before. First, this is a radiometric quantity, watts per steradian. This is the photometric quantity, lumens per steradian or candelas. Now, the, you can, the way to visualize uh, radiant intensity is simply if you have a light source and if you're looking at, a, a, a looking at it in this direction, how much flux is being emitted within a cone of angles where you're looking at, in the direction that you're looking at. So first of all, we have to define the cone. First of all, we have to define the area that's emitting. So this is this infinitesimal area, DA. Then you have to define the direction in which you're looking. So your eye is looking, let's say, in this direction. And that's defined by this, this ray here, which is, uh, let's say, theta, also defined here. We'll come back to that. And then we also have the extent of the cone Okay, which is d phi e, and also, of course, the solid angle, which is d omega, capital omega here, okay? So the radian intensity, or also referred to as radians, is the radiation flux per unit projected area and per unit solid angle. So this is watts flux per steradian per unit solid angle per unit area per meter squared. L is flux, d phi, divided by dA, unit area, cos theta, which is the projection, as we'll see in a minute, d omega, which is a unit solid angle. And that, this is what defines the projection. So this is the dA, <clears throat> excuse me, n is the normal to the surface, and this line here is the direction in which you're observing the, the surface of the bulb, for example and the angle between them is theta. So if you project this surface in this direction, you get dA cos theta. Then you have to also multiply, uh, divide the whole thing by d omega because that's the solid thing. So theta is the angle that the normal to the surface means the direction of the solid angle d omega. So you end up with this radiance equation where there's flux per unit area cos theta because that's the direction in which you're looking. d omega is a solid angle. Okay, now the radiometric quantities. The corresponding photometric quantity is luminance. So, of course, this is a radiometric quantity 
in watts per steradian per meter square, convert it into photometric quantities, luminous. Instead of <clears throat> looking at the total flux, you look at visual flux or luminous flux uh, divided by dA cos theta d omega. And this will be candelas per meter square because visual flux divided by d omega, the steradians, is candelas. So this is lumens per steradian, it's candelas per meter square, which is dA. So radiance and luminance can be functions of wavelengths, of course. Then we can define spectral radiance and spectral luminance, which are wavelength, functions of wavelength. So you have a spectral radiance, a spectral luminance. If you integrate over all the wavelengths, you get the total um, radiance and a total luminance. The luminance can also be related to the spectral radiance by simply doing uh, this integral, as we saw before, where you weight it with the sensitivity of the eye. So this is the total luminance, uh, as a spectral luminance, sorry, as a function of wavelength, multiplied by the sensitivity of the eye, integrate over all the wavelengths, multiplied by this constant 683, you get the um, total luminance. The radiation intensity emitted by an area A is flux divided by the solid angle. Now, if you go back to our previous equation, flux, oh, I'm sorry, flux divided by d omega is simply L multiplied by dA cos theta. Okay, I intensity from a infinitesimal area dA is simply L cos theta dA. Now, if the radiance is, if the radiance is uniform over an area A, not just an infinitesimal area, but let's say it's a uniformly uh, illuminating, emitting uh, uh, surface, like a very well-defined backlight, for example, of your, LCD, of your LCD display. The total intensity in a given direction is simply you do an integral over the area A, with, but it's, since the luminance is independent of A, you can bring the L out of the integral, and all you get is simply L uh, as a function of theta multiply by A, the total area, times cos theta. Cos, a cos theta is the projected area in the direction in which you're looking. If the radiance is independent of direction, let's say that the, the radiance does not change with angle, then you can simply define L of theta as L. And let's define I naught as L times A. This L times A is I naught. Then we get a very simple expression. I, the intensity, is I naught times cos theta. This is referred to as Lambert's law. Now, what does this mean? This means that if you look at a source on axis, light right at it, when theta is zero, you get the maximum intensity. As you start looking at it off axis, your intensity starts dropping. And this is, by the way, the case if you look at your iPad on axis, it'll look the brightest. And if you move it at off axis, you will see that the intensity drops approximately following this cosine theta dependence. Okay, and this is what's called Lambert's law. A surface is called Lambertian if it emits or receives radiation with an angular intensity pattern that follows Lambert's cosine law. It's solely dependent on the projected area, which is where this cosine theta comes from. And this is in general true for almost all cases, including the solar cells. So for example, if you're trying to do measure how much power is, com uh, uh, is absorbed by a solar cell as the sun moves across the sky, if it's not tracking, then you have to do this uh, cosine theta dependence because the sun is, uh, the, the angle at which the sun's hitting the solar cell, <coughs> excuse me, is, uh, has to be taken into account. Okay, now let's look at how this particular situation affects LEDs. Now, LEDs are very important because all your phones and your laptops and your iPads, for example, have a backlight, and these backlights are edge, uh, are illuminated by LEDs, uh, very similar to the planar LED in a gallium nitride substrate. These are the white LEDs. So let me explain why this is important. Let's look at three situations. When you have an LED, which is embedded inside a semiconductor, like a flat semiconductor, okay, you will have light coming out. But of course, because of the refractive index difference between this high index semiconductor and air, you will of course get a cone of angles that come out because you'll have total internal reflection here and you can work out the geometry. You can minimize some of that if you had a hemispherical size reality. But you can have a parabolic uh, dielectric on top of your reality. And and 
you can plot what's called a radiation pattern in this kind of a plot. It's, called a, it's a polar plot where the, the, the intensity, normalized intensity is plotted here from zero to one, and it's a circular symmetric. So you can see it goes like that. And these are the different angles. It's 90 degrees all the way to zero and 90 degrees on the other side. Okay, so this is basically the angle at which you're observing the light. And this is the intensity of the light that's observed, normalized to one. So if you look at the hemispheric LED, uh, so actually, yeah, let's look at the hemispheric LED where it's exactly a hemisphere, then it's completely uniform in the ideal case. You'll basically see an entire hemisphere of light coming out. Okay, minus 90 degrees to 90 degrees, is exactly all the same. It doesn't matter where you look at. Obviously, it's never true like that, but let's say in the theoretical case. If you imagine a planar LED, it'll look like a Lambertian emitter. So it'll follow the cosine theta. So it'll give you very high value at zero and it follows the cosine curve and it goes to zero at 90 degrees. Okay, and it's symmetric on both sides. And that's, you see this circle. Okay. If you have a parabolic LED, you'll end up with something which looks like that. And you can see the parabolic LED is more collimated. In other words, most of the energy is confined within a very small range of angles, let's say plus minus 20 degrees or so. As you get to large angles, the amount of energy goes down. Okay, so this is the key idea um, of why, um, the, you know, why the idea of membership emitter is important and how you can shape the radiation pattern by changing the, the profile of the LED that's used. And this is very, very important in backlights for displays. Okay, so this brings us to roughly half of the first half of the lecture, and I want to stop here and do a couple of examples. Actually, we'll do one example in the interest of time. And uh, the second example, I want you to do it at home. But let's do the first one first, uh, just to drive home the, the key concepts in uh, radiometric, uh, photom photometric units that we talked about. Let's imagine a small point source, and this point source emits light equally in all directions. Okay, with the radiant power of 10 watts. Very simple. Okay, I want you to solve this problem. What is its radiant intensity? And uh, again, please go ahead and discuss with your neighbors. So you can go back and look at the notes and think about what, you know, what, what does this mean? What is radiant power? What is radiant intensity? What is it asking for? And if you are already done with that, then you can also answer this question, what is the irradiance at a distance of R? Uh, and I need you to think about these because it's uh, important to drive home the concept. So uh, are there any questions before I, we go on to the solution? Uh, no. Oh, all right, so let's think about this for a second. So I tried to draw it here. So first, we imagine a point source and it's emitting in all directions. So imagine a wavefront of light, which is uh, basically emerging from the source going into all directions, like a big sphere. So how do you compute radiant intensity? Radiant intensity is simply the power divided by the total solid angle. So total power is 10 watts. Total solid angle across this entire um, sphere is four pi star radians. ST, I just wrote just for star radians. So simply 10 divided by four pi watts per star radian. That's the radian intensity. The irradiance on the other hand, which is the second question, is asking for power per surface area. 
Okay, this is insulation that we saw from the sun, for example. So total power is 10 watts divided by the surface area of the sphere, which is 4 pi r. Uh, 4 pi r squared. So a square is missing here, sorry. Okay, so it's 10 divided by 4 pi r squared watts per minute squared. So that's the radiance. So radiant intensity is per unit solid angle, whereas the radiance is per unit area. It's a key idea. Again, I know these things are new, so it will take you some time. So I highly recommend going back and just uh, uh, reviewing this yourself. Uh, the last problem, I will leave it to you to do as a homework. Uh, basically, let me go through what this means. So imagine a flashlight where you have a spot source, a point source here, uh, where the radiant source of the bulb is 200 milliwatts. Okay, that's what's coming out from here. What is the radiance at a distance 25 centimeters from the flashlight's front window? So imagine a perfect parabolic reflector here. So the light's going out like a cone of angles as shown here. These numbers are written. 25 centimeters, 10 centimeters. So at a distance of 25 centimeters from the front of the flashlight, what is the irradiance? Irradiance, as we know, is watts per meter squared. And what is the radiant intensity? Radiant intensity is watts per star radian. Okay, the three centimeter diameter is given here. This is a 10 centimeter diameter. With those two numbers, you can figure out the angle. From the angle, you can figure out how much the light is spread. And from that, you can figure out what the intensity is, it or radiance is. And also, because you know the angle, you can also figure out the radiant intensity. Okay, so I'm gonna leave this as an example for homework. So, okay, so the rest, of the class, I'm going to talk about color. And uh, color is, very, of course, very, very important for human perception, and particularly technologically important because uh, of all our color screens, right? Our TVs, LCD display for laptops, iPads, phones, whatever. So it's very, very important to understand. First, the physiological basis of color. So the, the reason our brain can see different color is because we have different cells in our retina that respond to different colors differently. So we have what are called blue cones, which respond very, very sensitively to blue light. So this is wavelength. So it's very sensitive to blue light, but not so sensitive to green or red. Or you can have green cones, which are sensitive to green light. Or you can have red cones, which are sensitive to red light. So you have cones are basically cone-shaped cells in your, in your, in your eye. We also have some, and these cones are basically used for photopic vision, which is photopic means, of course, as we saw before, it's when there's good lighting conditions, bright lights. But under low light conditions, something else kicks in, something called rods. And these rods are what are called photopic vision, uh, low light conditions. And these are generally not color sensitive, which is why it's difficult for us to distinguish color under low light conditions. Some of you may, uh, Know this. By the way, also this is, the, by the way, the reason people, some people are colorblind is because the green or the red or the blue cones are not responsive in the same way as normal people. So something like 30% of uh, men actually in the United States are colorblind. And the reason is the, the cone cells are, not, are, are malfunctioning. So how do we get color in a display? Color in a display can be achieved by color addition. So very simple example is if you have all the wavelengths, you get white, but if you somehow block out with the filter, the green color, and just add blue and red, get magenta. So color by addition, by simply adding different wavelengths, you can get different colors. And this is how uh, an example of an old uh, cathode ray to which used different dots, uh, with different colors to, to, to see, um, make uh, combinations of colors. You can also have color by subtraction. Uh, this is uh, a simple example of a liquid crystal where you have a color filter. And uh, the color filter simply, when you look, is illuminated by white light. Uh, let's ignore this for this, the, the beginning part for, for a minute. Uh, the white light comes in. It's absorbed by the color filter. Only red light is transmitted. So what's absorbed is the blue and the green. And the green essentially absorbs the blue and the red, passes the green. And the blue will absorb the red and the, the green and passes the blue. So you get the complementary colors. Now, this is, of course, the liquid crystal cell. The way this works is that you basically have a polarizer in the front, which takes in illuminating white light. 
polarizes it, passes through a transparent electrode array, passes through a liquid crystal cell. When, when a voltage is applied, the polarization of light is twisted, as shown here. So this polarization is different than this polarization. When it's twisted, when it, uh, the, light, the polarizer on the back here is rotated 90 degrees to this, so the twisted light will pass through, whereas an untwisted light is blocked by this polarizer. So that's just the mechanism of the LCD. Now, by choosing different amounts of colors, because of the color filter, you can get different colors. And that's basically shown here by overlapping different colors. In this particular case, instead of using red, green, and blue, they are showing uh, yellow, uh, cyan, and magenta. And you can get the same kind of things, the so green, red, blue, and black. Okay, that's color subtraction. It's illuminated by white light. So of course, color can also be obtained by microstructure. And there is a better way to do this because if you think about all these approaches, particularly color subtraction, you're essentially losing a lot of light because this absorbs the complementary colors. So I'll show you a very interesting approach that was recently developed by Panasonic for a display that uses essentially microscopic color splitters. So let me see if I can play this video. Let's connect this to the video place. Oops. Panasonic has developed a unique technology that doubles the brightness of color photography by using micro color splitters instead of conventional color filters in the image sensor. These two photos were taken using CCDs with the same sensitivity. The one on the right was taken with the color filter system used in nearly all digital cameras, and the one on the left was taken with Panasonic's new micro color splitting system. Until now, image sensors have produced color pictures by using red, green, and blue filters for each pixel, but with that system, 50 to 70 percent of the light is lost. <laughs> あつ、CCD this photo shows a cross-section of the new image sensor. The sensor uses two types of color splitters, red deflectors and blue deflectors. The red and blue deflectors are arranged diagonally, with one of each for every four pixels. RGB values can be obtained by determining the intensity of light reaching each of the four pixels. For example, if white light enters each pixel, Pixels where it doesn't pass through a deflector receive unmodified white light. But in pixels with a red deflector, the light is split into red diffracted light and cyan non-diffracted light. And when white light passes through a blue deflector, it's split into blue diffracted light and yellow non-diffracted light. As a result, the pixel arrangement is cyan, white plus red, white plus blue, and yellow. The RGB values are then calculated using a processing technique designed specifically for mixed color signals. To design the micro color splitters in this way, it's necessary to analyze optical phenomena such as reflection, refraction, and diffraction in 3D. Analyzing various wavelengths of light for each form of micro color splitter requires high speed computation, which hasn't been practical until now. また新しい解析手法を開発いたしました。まあ、PNDPN と呼んでますけれども、一般に使われているFDTD法に比べて、360度、メモリの4つのレンズ圧力と、メモリ消費量としても、わずか16分の1ということが分かっております。まあ、こ
モバイルで使える用途になるとか、この組み合わせだったら監視カメラ使えるとか、そういうようなあの、方式と用途との組み合わせというのがあります。それで対応していますので、その辺の研究というものをこれから、軸足を移してやっていきたいと思っています。Digging for news. Okay, so, so you, in that particular case, as you saw, it wasn't a, 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 a display, but it was an image sensor, so for cameras. But the, the principle is the same. Like, you know, in a conventional image camera, you also have a, what's called a bare filter, an absorbing filter. In this case, instead of having an absorbing filter, they basically have a deflecting system, and they, they create a color based on uh, diffraction, essentially. Okay, so uh, let's move on. Uh, colorimetry is a very, very complicated topic. Uh, you know, basic, basically, it's the topic of how our human brain perceives color and how do we quantify the physiological color perception. Uh, and this, uh, we don't really have time to go into, but it's, and it's very complicated. It deals with neuroscience and, and, and physiology. But uh, from our point of view as an engineer, we need to understand that the color perception by human being can be defined by what's called a spectral color stimulus. And this is what we need to do in order to design anything for human vision. It's basically what's called a tri-stimulus theory. Every color can be described by three numbers, which quantify the stimulation of the red, green, and blue cones in the human eye. And this is defined in a standard by what's called the Commission International De Le Clarage, or CIE uh, in French, standard colorimetric observer defines uh, XYZ color matching functions. <clears throat> and these color matching functions essentially try to represent our response to the three colors. So the, red, the blue matching function is here, the red is here, and the green is here, and these are defined like here. And then the tree stimulus value for any arbitrary spectral distribution where the intensity is a function of lambda is defined is simply the intensity is a function of lambda multiplied by the associated color a matching function integrated over the entire visible range. And that gives you a capital X. That's for the, the blue, the capital Y for the uh, green, and the capital Z for the red. Okay, so X, Y, and Z. So, sorry. These X, Y, and Z now represent three color coordinates, which for any given source spectrum, you can come up with three coordinate values. And these are so-called tri-stimulus values. And these are typically plotted in a two-dimensional plot in X and Y, but the small X and small Y are defined as the capital X divided by capital X plus capital Y plus capital Z, or capital Y is defined as cap, sorry, small Y is defined as capital Y divided by the sum of all three. So it's basically the average. And this X and Y essentially represent the color. It's a trace stimulus value, but you can essentially represent these two, the color with these two coordinates. The Y, and the reason is because Y is a measure of brightness or luminance, while X and Z are measures of color or chromaticity. Um, actually, wait. yeah, this should be Z, and this should be Y. So there's a typo here, I'll correct it. So we can use what are called projected coordinates, small x, small y, to define color. This is called a CIY, CIE, color space or chromaticity diagram. So you usually, if you look at a display or, or, or the color gamut, for example, of a TV or something like that, you get, you get these plots. And these plots, this contour of this plot represents the, the range of colors that could be represented by the display, for example. And there are millions of colors in between here, but that's the range. And that's defined by the small x, small y, and the color is shown here. These are for pure colors. So these are like monochromatic sources following this, this, this uh, curve in here. In between are mixed colors that you can achieve. And uh, that's it. That's where we will end today. So um, uh, today's lecture, I know it's a little bit new. So I highly recommend for you to go back and, and review it yourself. Try to understand the various quantities. It's important if you are ever want to understand the, the, the design of uh, human uh, systems for human perception. Okay, so just uh, remember the announcements at the beginning of the class. Make sure you, uh, the most importantly, make sure you uh, meet with your mentors. Don't forget. And uh, Naren, 
will take over now and uh, go over the uh, the midterm solutions. Okay, Naren, and uh, yeah, don't forget that the assignment too is next Thursday, so keep that in mind as well. Uh, this coming Thursday, we have a guest lecture from the Technology Venture Commercialization Office. Okay, uh, uh, before I sign off, are there any questions? No. Okay, Naren, are you uh, okay? You ready to take over? The... Sure. Okay, great. Thanks, and I will uh, let me stop the recording.